This is Robbie Luckett. I'm here with Merle Evers and Brandon Thompson. The date is April the 8th, 2013. We are in Air Hall at the Margaret Walker Center conducting this interview. Ms. Evers, do I have your permission to record this interview? You do. Can you begin by telling us some background about yourself, some biographical information, where you're from, and, and that kind of information? I'm a native of Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, I was educated there through high school and uh, immediately upon graduation actually I enrolled at Alcorn. Uh, it was then A&M uh, College and um, the first hour of the first day I met Metka Evers uh, that uh, made a major turn in my life uh, from the very beginning. Uh, Metka was a junior uh, in college, president of his class, uh, editor of the yearbook, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I came as a promising music student. Um, Metka graduated um, in two years, and I completed uh, my sophomore year, and we moved to the Mississippi Delta, uh, the Negro, all Negro town, as it was called then, of Mount Bayou, Mississippi. Uh, we worked for an insurance company which was owned by Negroes. It seems so strange using Negroes now, uh, but uh, that's what we called ourselves then, and, and it was totally a to uh, town totally owned uh, by us. It's still a very historic uh, town for many, for many reasons. We worked at an insurance company called Magnolia Mutual Life Insurance Company. It sounds so Southern, doesn't it? And it's because it was. Uh, Dr. T.R. M. Howard, a noted physician um, from Memphis, also had a home there. And he and a couple of other uh, local people started the Magnolia Mutual Life Insurance Company. Uh, after Medgar graduated from Alcorn, uh, he was offered a job uh, as an agent by this insurance company, and he accepted that. Uh, basically, as he said, it gives me a chance to be my own boss, to set my own direction, to help my people, and to give them a kind of dignity that they did not have and did not receive from insurance uh, agents uh, from other companies who came in who were Caucasian. And uh, the people were never addressed by name. It was always boy a girl. And Medga said, at least I can give them that dignity. Uh, he took that time uh, in selling insurance to also talk about the need to register and vote. Uh, that was really unheard of. Uh, during that time, and it was quite a big risk, but uh, he took the risk. A few times he was literally run off of, um, or chased, I should say, uh, off of plantations uh, because he talked about registration and voting and owning one's own business and whatnot. So it, it was a dangerous life. I was uh, secretary. Uh, at that insurance company. I operated my first IBM <laughs> machine many, 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 many years ago. So, uh, and we had two children uh, while we were there, Daryl um, and Rena. It was um, not necessarily the kind of life that I wanted. I was a city girl, Vicksburg, Mississippi, and uh, I don't know, somewhere along the line and Medgar's dedication to improving uh, life for his people, he became actively involved in the NACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And along with his work, he also sold memberships. Um, that received the attention of the National Office of the NACP in New York, uh, along with uh, Dr. Stringer uh, in Columbus, I believe it was, uh, what was his residence and, and his practice. Um, 
he became more and more interested in finding ways in which he could not only support his family, but also to support and encourage his people to move forward. That came to his decision to become a law student and successful lawyer. Mangu was the first Af known African American to apply for admission to Ole Miss. Um, and we were residents in Mount Bayou then, and I can recall how fearful we were of, of, of the danger that, that lurked there because he dared to uh, shake the walls of um, a beloved institution uh, in Mississippi. But I'll move forward to that. That, that did not happen. He was rejected, uh, understandably so, during that time. Uh, that would be the case, but he uh, was invited by the NAACP to open up the first office in Mississippi, and Jackson was chosen as the place. We moved uh, from Mount Bayou and moved to Jackson, Mississippi, and life was never the same after that. So that, that kind of describes uh, my movement, his movement through our native state of, of Mississippi uh, up, up to that point. And um, what, can you back up just a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about Alcorn, what led you to Alcorn and what it was like uh, to be there? Sure. It was tranquil to be <laughs> at Alcorn. Uh, it was located in what I think I called then a very rural uh, area. But let me flip back to, to a part of the question. Uh, what, what, what was it like? Why all corn? I had studied piano from the age of four with the hope, or my grandmother's hope, of my having a career in music. She always talked about um, her desire to see me become superior enough in my talents to play a Carnegie Hall. That was her dream. So all through school and high school, the piano was my instrument of choice, and I have to say I was very, very good at it. Uh, the person that I studied under for years um, was a graduate of Juliet. Ju Juilliard School of Music in New York. So, I mean, I really had a fine background there. But I applied to uh, the Mississippi Department of Education. I think that is what it was called then. I'm not quite so sure. But I applied for scholarship to study music outside of the state because the two colleges, um, well, actually three, there was Tupelo, Jackson State, and Oilcorn uh, that were prominent. Did not those none of those offered uh, training in in piano. I applied for permission and scholarship to leave the state of Mississippi and to study. I had hoped at Fisk University. Um, <laughs> It just so happened that uh, the state decided, no, we teach you enough music at the two schools for your people that will serve you well, because you will be coming back to Mississippi. You will be in Mississippi to study, I mean to, uh, to teach. I recall, even as a 17-year-old, how livid I was that someone could dictate to me what and tell me what I wanted when I didn't want it. But eventually uh, I had no choice but to stay in the state and I chose Alcorn mainly because my piano teacher was a professor there. And that's how I met Medgar. So coming from Vicksburg, um, moving to the Delta 
and then back to uh, Mississippi southern part uh, at Alcorn and that was it and my life has been tied to Mississippi all of that time uh, when Medgar was assassinated in 1963 my children and I remained in our home uh, which was extremely difficult to do on an emotional basis. Um, dealing with the trauma that my children were going through and that I personally was going through, I made a decision to move. Um, I moved, I chose California only because Medica said if we ever leave Mississippi we'll go to California. I knew one person but I realized that uh, two years of college at Alcorn was not enough for me to survive and to take care of my children. So I made a determination to go back to school. And uh, I enrolled at Pomona College and had to start all over again. But I uh, got my degree in sociology. And uh, I think the rest of my life reads like a pretty interesting book. But just last year, I returned to Mississippi, and I returned to Alcorn, which is now uh, no longer uh, an agricultural college. But um, I'm there, and I made the statement, I'm home. And I was shocked that I said that. Um, but it's true. I'm home. So from Vicksburg to the Mississippi Delta and back. What was life like in Mount Bayou? Mm. I love the people in Mount Bayou, but I did not particularly care for Mount Bayou. I certainly respected the history uh, of the town. But housing was under par. Um, facilities almost non-existent. I think of the streets in the summer and uh, the dirt uh, would come up to your ankles almost. And in the winter, when it would rain, it became what we knew as gumbo mud. <laughs> You'd step in and that mud was so thick and whatnot, you'd have to kind of work hard to pull each foot out to make the next to make the next step. Um, there was a sense of pride that people had um, there, but it left so much to be desired. It just left so much to be desired. Down to minute things such as. The magazines at the one little drugstore were three months old. You know, um, the movie house was, of course, you could sit anywhere you wished because it was an old Negro block town. But the movies were old and everything was dilapidated. It really stood in need of being loved and cared for. What did you think when you, when when Medgar joined the NAACP and started selling those oh. memberships? When Medgar joined the NAACP, I became instantly afraid. Even though I didn't know that much about the organization, I knew enough about it to know that it was a hated and despised organization in the state of my birth. Um, it was frightening because even then I could see his interest and his belief in breaking barriers as something that would threaten his life. Uh, and as I said, we had two very small children uh, at that time. And when Medgar applied uh, for admission to the University of Mississippi, uh, our second child and daughter was an infant, uh, or perhaps 
I was still pregnant, but I, I, I recall thinking, this is not going to work. Remember, that was the time when the two of us together made $3,000 a year. So with the major breadwinner not being there, how on earth would this mother of two babies uh, work and take care of the family? But Medgar believed, and when he believed in something, he believed. And he said, don't worry, I'll find a way. And I trusted him implicitly about that, and I knew he would, but I was fighting for his life. And so, what was your reaction to the job offer in Jackson? Relief! I was so relieved when when that job offer came to, to leave, for the chance to leave Mount Bio and come to Jackson, I probably jumped with glee. But I also realized that there was more of a threat uh, on his life holding that position and being in Jackson than ever, ever uh, before. But it gave me an opportunity, and I'll use the word to escape the poverty uh, uh, of, of the Delta. And it wasn't, I'm not saying that we had money because we didn't, we were poor, but it was an opportunity to lift ourselves up. And on Medgar's side, not only to lift up his family, but also uh, his people and his state, because he did believe in Mississippi. And I, being born in Mississippi, I still couldn't understand how he still felt hope in belief in the state, but he never lost it. When was that? Do you remember about what year that was when you moved to Jackson? Oh, approximately 52, 53. I'll have to check. <laughs> and, and where did you move when you came to Jackson? We moved um, in a community near Lanier High School. Um, I'm wondering if it was called Magnolia Street. For some reason or the other, that resonates with me. But a group of apartments uh, very close to, uh, to, to Lanier High School. I recall the two bedrooms, the living room, and this tiny, tiny kitchen and bathroom, but the bedrooms were large enough to have a single bed and one baby bed in it, and that was it. There was barely room to, to turn around and move out. Um, but for whatever reason, that's where he chose for us to go, and it was probably um, ideally located to the office on Ferris Street. Um, and all we could afford. And what were you doing at the time in Jackson when you first came? I was a medical secretary. Uh, I did everything the secretaries do, plus the cleaning and, 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 and everything else. We were quite a team, I, I have to admit. Uh, we had one of these wonderful understandings uh, that once we got to the office, he became Mr. Evers, and I was Mrs. Evers. We never called each other by first names. We always, and I emphasize, always kept personal life outside of that office. And people would tease us, you know, well, well, why are you so formal? Well, it's an office. Can you talk about the office on Ferris Street, what it was like, what it was like to work there, and what Ferris Street was like? Oh, Ferris Street was, um, at that time, was a bustling street. Uh, there were businesses there. Um, I remember one in particular uh, was a, a shop for women uh, that had the 
of the end clothes and hats and bags uh, there. Um, there were the restaurants. There was the one movie theater where we could go and sit anywhere we wished to sit. Um, it was home. It represented comfort. It represented a culture. It was a place where people could come and meet and feel safe uh, in parking on the streets and and meeting, and it, it, it was a center. I, I, I recall our walking up those rickety stairs in that building, and the building was either directly next door to a funeral home or maybe one building in between. And um, everyone watched out for everybody. It was uh, a meeting place, a moving meeting place. And by that, I mean that people moved from one building to another, discussions about jobs, about the difficulty that teachers uh, had at that time, the test that they had to take, how they had to sign uh, a piece of paper saying that they would not challenge the state in registering to vote or to belong to the NAACP. Um, it was a place of coming together and being whole, uh, discussing the negative things in life, prompting other people to um, be a part in, in seeking change. And it was a place where students felt comfortable enough to come, even though there were not that many uh, who came to the office at that time. But the, it was, I think it was the beginning of, of, of a surge of, of uh, youth uh, activity uh, in the movement. What was work like in that office? What was it to work for? Yeah, what was the work like? What were you doing? <laughs> I did a little of everything, but basically uh, I did research on certain subjects uh, that Metal was interested in. I did all of the correspondence, uh, all of the monthly reports that he had to do that went back to uh, the NACP headquarters in New York. Um, I did whatever had to be done. What do you call it? Girl Friday, whatever. I was his, sophisticatedly, I was his assistant. Do you remember any of the other tenants that were in that building? You know, I really don't uh, at, at, at this point. I, I, I have passed by that building over the last few months, five or six times. And I look at it and I have these flashbacks of climbing the stairs in this tiny, teeny little office and the phone calls, uh, threatening phone calls that would come through. But most of all, I th think I remember the people who were a part of a growing movement and it gave them a place to come and to talk, to plan, and to hope. It, 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 it was good, it was crowded, it was hot, it was dirty, and you, you, you know, it, but it was alive. It, it, it was alive, and Ferris Street was alive at that time, very much so. And how long were you, you, you in that office and when and under what circumstances did, did Medgar leave that office? You know, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing at this. Maybe two years? Maybe two or three. I'm not exactly sure. Um, over time, memories fade. And for me, unless 
some event happened that is indelibly printed on my mind, those things around it become just a little bit, a little bit fuzzy. It's only when I have this precious opportunity of meeting with and seeing people who were there and around at that time, and we sit and we talk, and one memory brings another and another and another. And, uh, but the office moved, right? And left Fair Street and mm -hmm. moved. Fair Street, and, and we moved to um, um, Lynch Street to much larger facilities, um, and that became home. Was that and I, I, and I believe it still is home for the NAACP. Was the move because of the need for more space? <laughs> the move was for the need of more space. And um, the Stringer Grand Lodge uh, issued the invitation and uh, said, come and join us, and it was a, a brave thing to do then, but uh, it was most welcome, not only by Metger and, and, and myself, but uh, NAC peers and others who were even afraid to participate and be seen. There was something about the safety of the largeness of um, the Masonic Temple building that said not only are we moving up, but we are moving out. And what about the move out of that small apartment that you first lived in? <laughs> <Jackson? laughs> oh, I was so delighted to get out of that tiny teeny. Oh, matchbox. Um, Medgar was forward thinking, much more so than I. Uh, and he believed in ownership uh, of whatever it was we could possibly have and encouraged that amongst his people uh, as well. There was a developer uh, who was in the process of developing a housing section for us. <laughs> um, there was a lot of excitement about it because Jackson had no such development as that. Um, the street was called Gines Street, uh, slightly outside of the city, not, not the city limits, but um, uh, close to the city limits. And it was the first time that I think the African American population had a chance to to see what a, a development such as that would look like, and it was a prime place to um, to try to get into. I don't know how we pulled together the money for the down payment. I truly don't. I just remember writing those checks every month to Prudential Life Insurance Company. <laughs> and I remember the amount and wondering if we could afford it. The amount was $53 a month. And we were struggling to try to, to pay that and not fall behind. Even though I worked with Medgar for a couple of years, I did, well, we, we made the decision that I needed to be at home uh, with the children, so how do you, how do you do that, you know, with, with, with such reduced income with no, uh, uh, and that income being so very small. But uh, it was worth it. I still worked from home. I was not paid. But I still helped Medgar, did research for his speeches and uh, helped with reports and uh, whatnot, and became the hostess for him when dignitaries and whatnot would come 
to the house and we barely had money to buy food for me to prepare for them, you know, so it, it, it became a challenge all the way around. But the joy was being at home with the children, um, particularly when we didn't know what would happen uh, to Medgar. We knew, I knew, that the chance was, was, was great that he would be taken from us. But it was something about uh, that sense of community and there was a sense of community on Guyon Street. Uh, people moved in who were school teachers, uh, insurance uh, agents, uh, a pharmacist. It, it, it was what we would call today an upper class uh, uh, community of professionals. Tell us about the house on Guyon Street. <laughs> the house on Guyon Street was certainly uh, uh, much more palatable than uh, the apartment we had lived in. First of all, it was new. Uh, secondly, we had a carport. We had three bedrooms, even though the bedrooms were very small. Uh, the kitchen was tiny, but it was my kitchen, and it was new, and it was clean. Uh, the living dining room, um, were two in one. We had hardwood floors. I'll tell you something about the women on Guyon Street. We were friends and we competed. Who was the best cook and who was the best housekeeper? We had no machines as such to help us keep those floors waxed. So we would get down on our knees we would clean the floors and then we would put the wax on the floors and this was not liquid wax, this was paste wax. You imagine on your knees putting down paste wax and worse than that you had to buff it by hand because we, we didn't have a buffer, we didn't have all of those things. So there was a competition between us. Who had the shiniest floors, who had the loveliest landscape, um, the best cook, the best seamstress, and I never even tried to compete with being a seamstress, but um, the ladies would sew for each other, uh, for the children in, in, in particular. We nurtured those children on Garden Street, uh, and there were quite a few but no child had to suffer for anything, for attention, love, uh, the love of learning, because some of them were teachers. Um, it, it, it was a wonderful place, I think, for children to grow up in. I, I have seen a, a, a photograph just recently of, um, a number of the children on the street gathered at the edge of a lawn and at that time the ditch was not paved and these kids are sitting there in all of the glory of being children, each one with a piece of watermelon. And as a friend of mine who, who saw that photograph said, how southern this is, you know, and truly. It, 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 it was so Southern, but no child went unattended, regardless of whether it was praise or questions that led the child to study uh, more and to accomplish more. It was just a wonderful neighborhood, wonderful neighborhood. Were you living on Guy's when your third child was born? When my third? Yes. Yes. I have to think about that. Hold on, we're going to have to pause for one second. Rena is outside. Uh huh. <laughs> and we probably are out of time. How are we doing? We still have another 30 conference call, but it sounds like you guys are on the wall. We're right in the middle of Guy Street. Are you serious? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I'll make my answer shorter. No, I don't want you to do that. <laughs> no, I will, because no, you know me. I just need to know what to tell Jan and Chris. <gasps> oh. Don't. See, see, no, 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 no. no, no. The, 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 I can take care of this. Just, um, just keep, because this is important to, to get this going. So. Rena, re, re, find another time today, yes. if you can. Okay. Tonight? Right. Okay. Well, tell me about Okay. My, and my regrets. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking too long here. <laughs> my answers perfect. are too long. Um, I'm, well, we're right in the middle of Guy Street, so we're okay, kind of at the, at the meat of it right now. Okay. I'll speed it up, dear. I'd suggest like, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, probably. Okay. Goes okay. I'll speed okay. it up. Oh, I forgot about that. No problem. Okay, we're good. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about Gine Street. Can you tell us about some of the people who stand out in your mind who lived on Gine Street? Almost all of my neighbors, because we had teachers, we had, um, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Mr. Wells who had a furniture business, uh, Mabel Pittman and her husband, um, teachers. Um, directly across the street from me, the Young's teachers, uh, right next to them, a business owner, uh, you'd move on up the street, a pharmacist, uh, a minister, and there was Margaret Walker Alexander, a famous poet, um, instructor, so we had this mixed group of professional people who did not act as professionals. And by that I mean they did not remove themselves from uh, the community. And we were a closely knit group, closely knit group. Uh, Margaret Walker, in a sense was held in lofty respect because she was such a good, decent person, such a oh, big heart, an artist who spoke to the souls of her people and the challenges that were faced uh, in her work. And she was deeply revered by everyone uh, there. Uh, her children played with all of our children. Uh, they loved to ride bikes uh, down the street and it was slightly hilly. Metgar would often uh, challenge the children to, or they challenged him, to race down the hill. And they knew they could beat him. And it, it was amazing to, to stand at our home, which was near the bottom of this slight hill, and look up and see all of these kids on their bikes near Margaret Walker Alexander's home because it was kind of at the level part and then the street would come down. All of these kids, particularly the boys, would be on their bikes just ready to go. Mr. Evers, we're ready, come race with us. And you'd see their little legs just pedaling coming down the street and Medgar would always beat them. You know, they, and they never understood how this man could run so fast and would beat them down to the bottom of the hill, you know. But usually they congregated uh, uh, at the top of the hill uh, where uh, Margaret House was. It was a wonderful neighborhood uh, of 
growing up and for safety and challenging children to learn and to be responsible. Whenever uh, one child would get in trouble uh, with their parents, and at that time we did something that I don't believe happens now. We punished our children in different ways, depending on what it was that they did. Some was just a stern talking to, the other might have been putting your hands on the shoulder and kind of squeezing and saying, I mean business, don't do that anymore, to the use of something that I think is found upon today, but we certainly did it, uh, and that's a switch. And for those who don't know what a switch is, uh, all of us on Gine Street had fruit trees. And you would send the child out to, to pull one of these thin little undeveloped limbs. But when I say limbs, I mean tiny, tiny, teeny, just developing. And it would sting. And um, <laughs> everyone always knew when someone else was going to get a switching and they would come and stand outside and listen to hear the child. Please don't, not anymore. I won't do it anymore, I promise. I wonder if Margaret Walker Alexander ever wrote a poem about switches and punishment because it, it was, it made a statement that I'm the parent, I'm the guardian, I have rules and regulations, and you are my child, and you have to follow those. And no one in this neighborhood is going to say, don't punish that child. Uh, we're not going to hit or tap the other's child, but certainly we'll say to that parent or parents, your child did this today you need to do something about it. Well, what did you do? We just talked to him, or we talked to her. But it was that kind of community uh, in which we lived and grew. Did you visit each other's homes? Oh, yes. We visited each other's homes, and we had monthly meetings um, where we would go from one home to the other, uh, of us on the blog, and there was always this, <sighs> I think I make the best cakes, I make the best pies. It, it was a d display of one's um, talents. Um, I'm not sure we read poetry, we probably did, but uh, it was a way to enhance living in that community, but also our outreach to our students and, and, and others uh, within the school system. So that was a competition. Uh, we have uh, a couple of pictures around uh, where we brought out our best glasses, our best silverware, our best of everything, and dressed in our finery. And we would plan activities, um, particularly for Christmas uh, and Thanksgiving, because we had a competition as to which home had the best uh, cutouts or Christmas scenes and whatnot. So it, 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 was, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful community. I will say this, however, that As the Civil Rights Movement took on momentum and more and more beatings and murders began to emerge, a fear took over in our community uh, because Medgar was a point person. So as people liked him, respected him, there was still the fear that he brought into that community. And some people began to pull back. Oh, some brave enough to say why, others not. They just 
pulled back when we realized it was because they were afraid. Margaret uh, Walker Alexander wrote about her concerns and encouragement. Um, she was a powerful voice. As I recall someone saying, her gun was loaded with intellectual bullets. And she could make statements through her poetry that others were afraid to, um, were afraid to say. And she had such a gift uh, for that, so open uh, in her home. And I'm tempted to say she did not suffer fools, which was marvelous uh, during that time, you know. Be open-minded, be creative, um, challenge and don't be afraid to do so. She used the tool that was her strongest. It was her mind, it was her heart, and she gave generously uh, of the two. And that's why I believe she will always be cherished throughout mankind because her depth and understanding of what was going on and her ability to be able to portray it uh, in such a dynamic, sometimes soft, uh, but powerful way will live with us forever. Do you remember her house? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, she had, I believe at the time, her house was the only two-story home that we had on Guide Street, uh, white, um, with kind of the attitude of like, oh, she has a two-story home and we only have a one-story. Observation, but not an observation with envy. It's just the way it was. Treasured and a treasure. She was very uh, afraid for Medgar uh, and his life. I'm not sure she revealed that uh, publicly. She probably did, but I don't recall uh, that at all. But she spoke to the ills of society, uh, not only in Mississippi, but uh, nationally. And her work will live forever and give great insight into that period of time. And of course her and Megger's life also intersected on Lynch Street here in Jackson as, as well because of Jackson State College. Can you talk about that connection and the significance of Lynch Street and Jackson State at that time? I don't know if I really can do that part justice. I really don't. But there is another connection. The street that, that we lived on was Gine Street. It was later changed to Margaret Walker Alexander Street. And I still call it Gines out of old habit. But every time I do, Margaret Walker Alexander flashes in my mind and, and, and I see her. No nonsense person but warm and understanding and demanding. I will add that word to a description of her. Demand, she demanded excellence. You can't get much better than that as a teacher. You mentioned the monthly meetings. Was that part of the, the garden club? Oh yes. <laughs> But uh, it, it was not just a garden club. It, it was a garden club, but we discussed current issues. 
Yeah, it, 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 it was uplifting mentally, it was uplifting for us in terms of our culinary skills and uh, getting our husbands to work to make the design for the next uh, Christmas decorations or whatnot, and it was a support group. It was a support group. The women of Garden Street, hmm, I like that, were very blunt, uh, yet friends, but very blunt with each other. We didn't agree if we thought something was something else was needed in our block or not. We, we, we were there and we discussed it openly. Not only discussed those issues, but all the solutions. And that was a kind of Margaret or Alexander thing. You can define something, but you need to go steps beyond that. Define it, but what do you do about it? And how do you go about doing those things? She challenged us. Yes, I'm sure we challenged her too, but um, such a wonderful, warm, sensitive, strong individual who happened to be female. How would you describe the lasting legacy of that, um, that interaction of Guy Street, that relationship between arts and activism and that um, that that legacy of Medgar and Margaret. How would I describe? How would you describe to? the legacy of Medgar and Margaret of arts and activism? Art and activism go hand in hand. Can you have one without the other? I don't think so. Uh, Art comes from the sight and what you see from the inside. But activism also comes from the inside out. And somewhere those two meet um, to make a tremendous force for change. Do you see a direct legacy of Medgar and Margaret specifically? They're two very separate ones, but uh, certainly I think we have seen over the years uh, that students and others who have studied the two bring them together as one, of one purpose. Can you have a learning process and not have activism? I just ask that question. I don't see it. If it's not activism out in the streets or whatnot, it's activism of the mind. We need both. We need both. And I think with uh, Margaret Walker Alexander and Medgar, we have the best combination ever of what those two aspects of life are all about. I'm very glad to have known them both and uh, certainly to have been a part of that time. Margaret speaks at length in her journals about the impact Megger's death had on her. Did the community of Guy Street, did that support system help you at all through that tragedy? It helped. Uh, and I say it like that only because there was so much fear. Uh, people on the street didn't know when or if the night Riders, when I put that term in quotes, would return. Some felt guilty uh, because they had not been as supportive of Medgar as um, they possibly could have been. Um, it was a strange time because your heart said one thing 
and your mind said something else. And safety of oneself and one's family certainly took precedence over, over someone else. Um, it was difficult for me to deal with because a couple of members of the community did speak out and say perhaps he should move his family, we want to be safe. Um, I was a very young woman uh, then. I had just recently turned 30 uh, when Metal was killed. And on one hand, there was a fear that his death would happen very soon. Uh, but also the frustration and the anger of wanting more people, not just on John Garden Street, but throughout Jackson and Mississippi to, to say, here, I'm going to take this stand. Um, It did not happen as quickly as I had hoped. But I had the difficulty of rearing three children, of helping to erase their fear. The difficulty in erasing my hatred because it was that hatred that kept me afloat. The public as a whole thought I was such a, quote, nice, forgiving lady. That was the surface. They had no idea what was going on beneath the surface. I was angry. I was hurt. And I was determined to pay them back. So I went around for a while with split personality. In public, it was all smiles and nice, and people saying, you're such a good woman. And I'm smiling and saying, thank you. You just don't know. Because at home, at night, I plotted and I planned, and I even asked some of the men on Guyon Street to meet with me at my home, of which they did. And they thought I wanted them to do something around the house, a building, whatnot. And I had a different, <laughs> a different thing to ask them to do for me. And they were all shocked. And they all said, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And I said, that's okay, I'll find a way myself. So my way became working over the years to see that those three trials took place and that the uh, guilty verdict came in. I remember Margaret telling me, though, not to let the hatred destroy me. We are in the last five minutes of this Okay. Interview, but uh, we got to switch out this tape. It's going to be done in 20 seconds. So, okay. I want to, we're on a really great part right now, but it's. I've given you so much more than, than what you asked for. That's wonderful. Well, That's I wonderful. talk too much. Well, it's, it's okay. We, we can probably keep going on for a long, long time, but I, 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 no, I do I want to come back to and, and, um, and talk about things that what you were just speaking on, so I think that's really wonderful. Um, so as soon as we get this... I'm going to send you a bill for this. <laughs> but I don't know that we can afford you. That might be true, <laughs> what I would ask for. You can always ask, you don't always get. Okay. I just want to be sure to have a copy of it. Absolutely, yeah. we'll most certainly make a copy available for you. So you were, you were talking there about 
um, the men of Guyne Street. What was it that you had asked the men of Guyne Street to do for you after Medgar's death? I said, you know who he is because it was known. Find him and bring him to me. Secure him and leave. Now, it can be left up to the imagination of the person who's seeing this or whatnot as to what my plans were. And I was as sincere about that then as I am sitting here now. It was that anger, that pain, and that hatred, and the need for revenge that kept me going. Kept me going. There were two parts. The other was to be sure that my children were secure and safe. But uh, I did have a dual personality at that time. And it's amazing how hatred can give you the strength to go against odds that you would never think that you could. And I would fantasize about that at night. I married Medgar when I was 18. I met him when I was 17. He was not only the love of my life, but someone I deeply respected for who he was, what he believed in, his willingness to give up his life. Oh, for his people and for humankind. It, um, I can't explain to you how deeply I love that man and how deeply he impacted my life. And he was the father of my children and I would be darned if I was going to be the nice little widow sitting back and smiling and nothing else going on inside. That's what the public saw. But behind closed doors there was something else. And I sit here 50 years after that and I think about where I am now. Uh, once the guilt of it came down, I became a free woman because I had kept the promise that I made to Medgar the night before he was killed, that I wouldn't rest until justice prevailed. And it took all those years, it happened. But I constantly heard his voice, and I think it's one that Margaret probably heard too. Don't allow hate to ruin your life. I have been in survival mode for so long. Not necessarily now, but I mean in, in, in years past. That there were two things that kept me going. And that was the need uh, through legal ways to pay back. Pay back the man, pay back society for what happened to Medgar. And the other was to achieve the best life that I could for our children. and a degree of success for myself in terms of my work, my jobs, those kinds of things. Because Medgar always told me, you are so much stronger than you think you are. I've been blessed to be able to accomplish all of that. 
I don't need hatred. I don't want it. I don't want anything to do with it. Because there is a source that's so much stronger than that to make change. And I understand now, and I have for some time, how he could say what he said and believed it. Because I'd always challenge him. I said, certainly you can't believe that. Oh, yes, I do. So, you know, 50 years of juggling and remembering, remembering and being stimulated by the need to pay back. But switching from the negative to the positive. How can I pay back by being strong, by having a vision uh, of doing what's right? Not just for myself, my children, my people, but for people as a whole. Medgar often said, I love the state of my birth. And I'd say, how can you say that? How can you say that? He said, because I believe it. And that's what I'm here fighting for, too. So finally, you know, I can say, hey, kiddo, I understand what you meant because I'm there now. But the search still goes on, and I think Margaret Walker Alexander would agree with me with that. The search for human rights, justice, equality still go on. And today we realize that there are still blocks out there that will probably always be throughout eternity. That's a human being that we are. But with enough of us understanding and coming together and working on a day-to-day -day basis, things can continue to grow on behalf of all of us. And for Margaret, I've got one final question. Ah. You, you I finished. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, um, the reaction of your neighbors on Guy Street, but also would just like to for you to speak to the reaction on Lynch Street of the people to the memorial procession that happened after Medgar's assassination. Let me go to the procession that took place uh, after Medgar's first funeral service, which was on uh, Lynn Street. And people followed the cars of the, with, with the families in it and the hearse. Something snapped. And we have photographs of this large crowd of people beginning to rush, run, walk fast, and then run toward downtown where on Ferris Street, uh, that was the location for the funeral home. And they began to chant. And I think that was the beginning of the turn of their. And they chanted, after Medgar, no more fear. After Medgar, no more fear. After Medgar, no more fear. And I think those photographs speak louder than words can, because people had been frightened to death. And they came together after that, and things were never the same. And how did you feel after Byron Edelbeckwith was finally convicted? Free. Three trials. And I have had people from all walks of life, all colors, tell me, basically, you're a fool because nothing's going to change. First, I was told no white man will ever be brought in. No white man will never go before a jury. If a white man 
goes before a jury, he will never be convicted. But you know what? Promises are strong. And I made a promise to Medgar the night before he was killed that if anything happened to him and I survived, I would see to it that justice prevailed. I cannot tell you how many people, friends and non-friends and whatnot, told me I was a fool. It would never happen. And I kept believing. The only time I had doubt was when the officer came to the hotel room to tell my children and I that the jury had come in with a verdict. And we didn't think that that was going to happen. I believe it was on a Saturday, I'm not sure. And we were all still in bed. Can you imagine this room full of family members trying to get to one bathroom, you know, to get dressed to go out? And, and because we were told, and when they come in, he is going to have the verdict read regardless of whether you are there or not. So we went out half dressed. I think we brushed our teeth, but that was probably it. And we're taken to the courthouse. Rush up. We got in, and the judge asked for the verdict. And the verdict was given guilty. If someone could have captured the ghost that had been in my body all of that time. They would have seen it just whoosh. Only leave my body at one time. That's the way it felt. And it was like, hey, Lope. It was Medgar's nickname. I kept my promise. And it's happened. I remember every fiber of my being trembling. But it was almost a, a, a parting sentence of, to all of those negative feelings get out of here. It's done. Okay. Any final thoughts? No. <laughs> <laughs> You've gotten so much more. Thank you. This has been wonderful. I didn't know. I talked too much. <laughs> it's great. I should have had you stay just to Margaret Walker Alexander, but you know, I'm... Well, it's all related, and it's all informing. Yeah. In a way, I'll be glad when we get over this 50th. Um, I don't know the best way to say this. I'm growing. Or I'm leaving behind the past. Hmm? You've been everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I guess all all over the place. I hear you agree. I know every weekend. It seemed like <clears throat> for the last three months you were speaking quite a few places actually. Yeah. But I've been all over the place emotionally too. Yeah. I can imagine. I have. I, I have. Ne never thought, you know, after this and I was very, very blessed to have a second husband who was very, very understanding and supportive. He has his own story. Walter was the person who filed a suit against the International Longshoremen's Union to break down hiring practices oh. there. So he had been through the threats and the attempted beatings and, and whatnot. And 
in, in Los Angeles and California and knew of Medgar. He didn't know him, but knew of him and had tremendous respect for him. And as he said to me, when we did meet uh, years later, he said, I saw you on television the day after Medgar was killed. Dan Rather interviewed you, and he said, I looked at you and your children, and I said, God, I wish I could take care of that family. And I told him, I said, I hey, didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, be careful what you ask for, yeah, you may get it. Exactly. <laughs> well, that'll be our next interview. <laughs> <laughs> Young man did um, his thesis on Walter 